So, you have an interest in mixing, and you're looking to avoid the pitfalls that swallow up lesser engineers. Well, you've come to the right video. What follows are some of the biggest traps we've seen bedevil nascent engineers. But before we go any further, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to be notified when more free educational content lands. Now, without further ado, here's 10 mixing mistakes beginners always make. Not having a clear idea of what you want to do. This is an affliction that doesn't just affect beginners. People get caught up in this one all the time. It can be enthusiasm as much as anything else. We just want to keep working, so we often don't let ourselves stop to wonder what we're trying to accomplish in the first place. Now, a contractor would never build a house with only a loose idea of where the bedroom is. So why do we think we can fashion a mix with little idea of how we want the base to end up? It may be suitable for artists and producers to mess around, but we'd wager that our job in the mixing music phase is more like artfully executing blueprints than painting a landscape. If you agree, then it's best to have a clear idea in mind, even if it's only a glint of what you want to do before you set out to do it. Want to make something brighter? EQ or saturation is probably the tool for you. Want to add rhythm or swagger to a sound? Explore time-based effects like reverb, delay, phasing, or flanging. Not sure what to do? Isotope's mixing and mastering tools like Neutron, Neoverb, Nectar, and Ozone Pro all have helpful assistants that take into account the sonic direction in which you want to go, then listen to your track and give you a great starting point to get you over the hump. So try them if you're stuck. And remember, sometimes a track doesn't always need processing if it sounds great to you and works within the context of your mix. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Employing too much processing on a track. Piling oodles of plugins on individual tracks is another huge mistake we see in beginners. Now we've all fallen victim to this and it's hard because we see our idols do it on tutorials, in blog posts, and sometimes in person, but our idols have a method to their madness. When your favorite pro displays an eight plugin chain on a video, they're showing you a step-by-step -step blueprint. They know why one EQ might be right for the high pass on a track and why the next is appropriate for boosting the high mids, why such and such a compressor has the perfect complementary tone, and most importantly, how all the plugins are gonna work together. Yes, it's important to search for the right moves to experiment with new tones, but experimentation can be detrimental, in the mixing phase at least, if you don't have an idea of the sound you're going for in your head, if not a concrete reference of the sound on hand. Try to restrict yourself to just an EQ and compressor. Try cutting frequencies that complicate the sound. EQ Learn in Neutron Pro can help you find those frequencies automatically so you know where to cut. Then listen to the track in the context of the mix, not in solo, more on that later, and see what it needs from there. A level boost? A touch of compression to ensure a consistent level? Does it need to be panned? Is it in the way of something important? Use your ears before gilding any more lilies in your mix. Trying to turn a sound into something it isn't. Mixing is all about blending sounds together in a pleasing way, enhancing what's already there in the service of the song. But sometimes when you mix, it's hard not to dabble in a little sound design, creating something new or distinctly different with the sound source. After all, modern plugins, even the stock variety that come free with your DAW, are extremely powerful, and it's easier than ever to take, say, a clean bass guitar and morph it into a larger-than-life distorted bass synth line. But just because you can doesn't mean you should. It's easy to get off course and completely lose the plot of what you're mixing when you turn a sound into something it isn't or shouldn't be. It comes back to this. Whenever you're reaching for a new plugin, do you know what you're trying to achieve with this next move? Are you serving or fighting the sound? And when you're working for a client, think, does this help serve the song or am I altering the sonic identity of a track toward my own tastes? Remember, your ego is not your amigo. Not paying attention to gain staging. Gain staging and loudness management are the solid foundations every mix sits upon, and yet it's often glanced over by people first learning the ropes. The impulse to turn tracks up is almost impossible to deny. Then we end up raising levels and raising levels until everything sounds like a big loud mess. 
When a session is properly gain staged, things sound balanced, whether it's a banger or a ballad, and that's ultimately what we're going for. Gain staging is the technical term for managing the loudness of multiple sound sources through one or more shared outputs. A gain stage is any point in the signal flow where volume can be adjusted and includes the level of an input on your audio interface, the fader on each DAW or mixer channel, the master output, as well as many other potential points in the signal flow. Check the description for a useful article we published on gain staging, as it would be really tough to cover all the best practices here. But here's an exercise you can do at any point in your mix, whether you're at the beginning stages or the end. Note that this may become more challenging if your session contains a lot of volume automation. Pull all the faders on your tracks down to zero so that when you press play, no sound is coming through the master output. Starting with the low frequency elements such as bass and kick, pull them all up until they're somewhere around minus 12 dB on the master output and sound like they're at appropriate relative levels. Then move on to the proper relative levels for the mid and high range frequency content. At this point, you should still be well under 0 dB, which will allow you to grab all the faders and pull them up until you're approaching the absolute level you're looking for. For many people, this process completely changes the way their mix presents and opens up a lot of space. When a session is properly gain staged, it makes the rest of the mixing process doable. It gives you room to compress your dynamic sound sources. It lets you properly sculpt and carve your sounds because you're hearing what you need to and it lessens many of the frustrations that come with trying to wrestle any mix into submission. The levels we set at each gain stage matter a whole lot, and if we really use our ears to set them well, we can set ourselves up for success at the onset. Not paying attention to phase relationships. When you're just starting out, it's hard to know if two signals are out of phase, especially if no one's around to teach you how to recognize the predicament. Let's start with drums, which are often problematic. So here's what to do when presented with a multi-mic kit that sounds washed out or lacks punch. Check the phase of the overheads against each other, flipping one of the overheads to see which gives a more cohesive, solid picture. You can do this with a utility plugin like Relay by clicking this icon, or Neutron Pro by clicking this icon. It's usually a night and day sonic difference. Then test other mics against the overheads in solo. Listen for which combination has more body in the lows and low mids. Also, watch the meters. Chances are, the polarity arrangement that yields a higher level will be the one that's in phase. Now, equally troubling for beginners can be knowing when to leave elements out of phase or knowing when to manipulate phase relationships for intentional effect. Drums don't usually apply here, but multi-miced guitar cabs do. In this case, you can think of the phase relationships between two mics as an opportunity for tonal variation, an EQ almost. Keep in mind that the quality of sound will change depending on the relational level of the tracks too. So to sum up, when mixing elemental instruments like drums and bass, check for phase and try to favor the cohesive picture. When mixing elements that are not so foundational to the track, learn to use phase relationships to create the best tonal picture putting reverb on every track. Don't fear a dry signal. Beginners often slap reverb on nearly everything, but you'll notice pretty quickly, this approach yields nothing but a pea soup of sound. It's important to be aware of how differing reverbs signify particular trends or genres, or how some sounds might've been recorded with reverb already, guitars being a good example, but also synths given to you by a producer. If putting reverbs on every track sounds like your bag, we invite you to try the following. Limit yourself to only two or three reverbs if possible. In fact, Neoverb Pro is one reverb that lets you blend between three different reverb algorithms at once, and its assistant automatically cleans up the reverb signal so it doesn't drown out the source that you have it on. Pretty handy. Maybe apply some verb to the drums, the vocals, a touch of exploding snare. The same goes for other effects. In our efforts to make everything interesting, we can sometimes dull the overall impact of the entire mix. Therefore, learn the intentionality behind modulation, delay, and conventional pitch variance. Understand what exactly a phaser will get you as opposed to a flanger or a chorus. Learn how delays can expand the spaciousness of a sound. 
a synced low-level stereo delay, for example. Or learn how these effects can establish a genre, like a rockabilly slap, for example. The bottom line is, use time-based effects, but keep them in check and down to just a few instances, or you'll drown out your mix and cripple your CPU. Working in solo for prolonged periods of time and not paying attention to masking. It's a classic mistake, one not ameliorated by a plethora of tutorials out there. Sure, plenty of big names have great tips to offer, and to demonstrate these tips, they'll often play their results in solo so you can better hear them. However, these engineers don't always remember to warn you about working in solo if you didn't know, and if you stumbled on one video, it might convey the wrong idea. So let's take this time to reiterate that, generally speaking, it's not good to mix a single sound in solo, as you lose perspective quite quickly. Still, there are caveats. For brief moments in time where it's necessary to hone in on a problematic part of a sound, like a resonant snare drum, soloing is appropriate. Also, there's nothing wrong with soloing a group of tracks. To mix the drums, the bass, and the vocal in solo in order to achieve a better microbalance is useful in short intervals. Once you let go of the solo button, you'll start to hear how the instruments get along. And this can be revelatory because beginners don't always understand where instruments sit in the frequency spectrum and how they can be masked by other instruments. Masking is where certain tracks are competing for space in the same frequency. If a kick and a bass are overlapping in the same frequency territory, it's likely that one of them will be less perceptible in that range. The good news is that Neutron Pro's masking meter can help you identify where frequencies are overlapping, and Neutron Pro gives you an easy way to untangle them without having to switch back and forth between instances of Neutron Pro. You can do everything from one EQ that's talking to the other EQ. Not paying attention to timing and tuning. If something is off key or out of time in a mix, it falls upon our shoulders as mix engineers to fix it as best we can, but always in line with the artist's intentions. Nobody is going to auto-tune Bob Dylan, at least I hope not, but the latest Top 40 pop star is another story. Similarly, a band like the White Stripes would get more off-the-grid leeway than an outfit like Imagine Dragons. It behooves you to vet the intentions of the artist and to check against the references you've been asked to follow, and then make the right changes to time and pitch. Adding tons of bass and treble. Ah yes, the dreaded smile curve. It's brought many a frown to budding engineers the world over. Rest assured, we've all been there, piling on bottom end and treble as though they're ingredients that can never go sour. This is one of the larger mistakes leading to ear fatigue and poor translation across speaker systems. You're already applying a Beats curve to music that might very well be played on Beats headphones, and double Beats is never good. No one likes to be asked to smile more, especially a great mix. Why not check your mix against Tonal Balance Control Pro? Tonal Balance Control Pro is designed to help you overcome your listening environment and make mixes that translate by allowing you to clearly view the tonal balance of your audio and compare it against 12 target curves representing popular music genres. Or you can load an audio file to create a custom reference curve. You'll know at a glance if your lows, low mids, high mids, or highs are over or under the mark. The more you check your mix against great references, the less you'll feel the need to exaggerate bass and treble. And as with earlier pitfalls mentioned, Discipline, in accordance with referencing, is the way out. Don't do it unless you know and have verified with a likable reference that the track calls for it. Going for a mastered sound. This pitfall is easily understandable because everyone wants to have a fully polished record right from the jump. Who among us hasn't fantasized about the mastering engineer saying, this needs nothing? Making the desire more tantalizing is the plethora of tutorials where Grammy-winning mixers show us their fully limited mix bus chains. You must remember, at your beginnings, that these are seasoned engineers, and one day, you will be too. When you're just starting out, it's good to match the master in terms of timbre, sure, but not in terms of loudness or level, because the tools to secure those higher levels are harder to hone. Again, Tonal Balance Control Pro can help you navigate this challenge. Instead, bring the reference down to give you headroom so you don't have to fight with the digital ceiling. 
Give yourself the chance to learn how signals play off each other with reasonable headroom before you worry about shaving off the peaks. Otherwise, you're in danger of fashioning a harsh mix. And what's worse, prolonging the learning process into a series of plateaus. It's like that old phrase, you've got to learn to walk before you can run. And that's it. Our 10 mixing mistakes beginners always make. What did you think? Are there any mistakes that we missed? Let us know in the comments and head to isotope.com for more free educational content. Happy mixing.